Hello and welcome to this video. My original intent was to compare the cameras on the Librem 5 with those of the latest versions of Google's Pixel and Apple iPhone 12. Unfortunately, while the camera was a promised feature of the Librem 5 at launch, it actually doesn't support taking pictures at the moment, so that plan doesn't quite work. Instead, I've gone a different direction. For those of you that were here to listen to my take on the current state of the Librem 5, please enjoy the rest of this video. A fully standards-based, freedom-oriented system based on Debian and many other upstream projects has never been done before. Bold claim. The Librem 5 phone will be the world's first ever IP-native mobile handset. Also quite odd considering that all 4G phones are based on an IP packet-based network. Not really sure what IP native means in this case. Using end to end encrypted decentralized communication over the internet. Nothing like that is built in on the version that they've released. So, September of 2018, I placed an order for the, uh, as a backer, for the Librem 5. I've got a bad habit of throwing money at open source phone systems. Probably my favorite phone to date, it's Nokia N900. So you can look at this as either my Nokia N900 or the shell of my Neo 900, which never materialized. Unfortunately, the hardware for this just doesn't run anymore. Even with a new battery, the system just thinks it's got a dead battery and shuts down very quickly and has trouble charging. So Libra 5 sounded like a lot of promise. Wasn't quite sure how it would do as a daily driver. It seemed worth backing. It's a company that made and sold hardware at the time. So it seemed like a little bit more promise than some of the other phones that I'd built, bought into, like, like the Neo 900. So I was excited when this ended up shipping, much later than expected. The phones were originally supposed to start shipping in April of 2019. They actually started shipping in late 2019 and then they were delayed because of the coronavirus outbreak at the start of the year, which shut down some of the manufacturing plants. My original release was going to be the, uh, what they called the Dogwood batch, which was gonna be their last developmental batch, which was gonna be delivered in February or March timeframe. But I ended up getting bumped into the Evergreen branch, which was supposed to be their finalized hardware, what I've got in my hand now, which I just received in the middle of November. I'm playing with this for a couple weeks now, taking a look at it. And while I can't speak to the hardware, it sounds like that's finalized, there's definitely a lot in this phone that is not production ready. And so let's walk through what exactly the experience is when you get this production Evergreen Librem 5, what you can expect from the experience, and where might that be taking us should you put $500 down? Actually, I guess they upped the price to $600. And when I just checked on the site now, it's now, let's take a look. It is now $800, $799. All right, so cut to the chase. Should you put down $799 for this phone? I don't think so. Let's take a look at what the experience is actually like. So first of all, the screen is not always responsive. The phone often loses track of what's actually enabled. Sometimes it'll be using Wi-Fi and will tell you that it can't find a Wi-Fi chip enabled. The Bluetooth is incredibly slow. I, every time I do this, it just keeps showing a bunch of unknown devices. It can't find or set any of them up. Uh, usually it'll find my TV pretty quickly, but everything else it just never connects to. It still thinks it is, uh, what, six hours from now. I've got both automatic date and time and automatic time zone. I've got it location services enabled, which it shouldn't even need because it should have a built-in GPS. Uh, it still thinks we're in the year 2055, though. Still thinks it's May. Time zone is still UTC, which 
I appreciate UTC rather than Pacific Time being the default. The interface is not optimized for touch. It's also confusing. There is a option for online accounts in the main settings. It supports Microsoft Exchange, but only Exchange Web Services. It doesn't support Active Sync. There's no way to sync calendars. There's no way to sync contacts. And if you happen to be using a service that supports Active Sync, but not Exchange for Web Services, you're out of luck. There's a way of setting up IMAP and SMTP. When I signed, set up an account that way, it was not recognized in the mail app. You actually have to go to the mail app, go to accounts from there, and set up a mail account directly through that. Oddly, once I did that, I actually set up an account four times for the same account because there was no, no feedback, which is a common issue with this phone as well, is that sometimes things just silently fail. Sometimes it says it failed, but it actually succeeded. It's just very bad at giving feedback. The usability in general of the phone is just very awkward. The keyboard looks fine vertically. Despite having accelerometer and gyroscope, the screen doesn't actually rotate for you automatically, and there's no way that I could find to do that. What you have to do is go up to the status bar, which looks a lot like the Android status bar, and manually rotate. And once you do that, you get a keyboard that takes up about two thirds of the landscape view, which is just wasteful. It's a slow, it's, it's much smaller. You don't get the added benefit of typing and it takes up half the screen. It's frankly a lot like the Nokia in 900, which is a smaller screen when it had its virtual keyboard. Fortunately, the 900, it had a slide out keyboard. So you usually avoided it when you were in landscape mode. Just so much extra space that's being wasted on either side of the keyboard. Another problem with typing, oops, let's get back to portrait. It's a lot of times trying to hit enter. It's really easy to miss that, that button or the dot and you end up clicking by accident on the bottom and you either hide the keyboard, which is annoying if you're on a terminal or you go back up to the task switcher. The messaging app, Although there is a lot of talk about things like Matrix and other systems, only seems to be able to add an XMPP account, Jabber account. Click on Add Account. You have to add a user ID and a password. You can't set anything else. You can't change the protocol. Only XMPP, no IRC, no, uh, I don't know what else anybody else uses. And you can't set anything like a server. You can't change any op options. I've dug around on why it refuses to connect to my server. I can see it looking up the serve record, so it's definitely looking up the serve records. So theoretically it should be connecting, uh, but it just fails and there's no indication why. There's no messaging that's available. It does not look like it supports anything like uh, Jingle or VoIP from XMPP. In fact, uh, one of the most surprising missing features that I found is the lack of VoIP. There's no way of doing uh, SIP or H323. There's no Twinkle, there's no Linphone. And that just seems like a huge gap for a Linux-based phone. The Nokia N900 had, had some really great features in it. Had a reasonable GUI, reasonable settings, had widgets, all those fun things. The killer feature that it really had was the integrations with its messaging client. It had a SIP client, it had a Jingle client, it had uh, AIM, it had Skype, it had IRC, uh, had a few other things. And you could connect, you could set them all up and they all appeared in one messaging app and you could just see them all in line. One of the things that really drives you the wrong way was a blog posting that, that Purism had that basically was adver advocating for the same thing, which is great, but treating it like it was some novel idea, whereas Nokia did this uh, 10 years before Librem 5 was even announced. And yeah, it was, it was a great experience. It, in both cases, I believe it's being done through LibPurple, which is the old game library, uh, now Pigeon. It's not the most featureful library, but it's easy to integrate with a new app, so it makes sense. 
But at the moment, none of these features are actually supported in the Librem 5. I can't even get XMPP to work, but that's the only thing that it claims works. Uh, in general, the UI is just clunky, in addition to sometimes not working. Uh, the phone shut itself down uh, when I was first playing around with it, just turned off and rebooted. Uh, seems like something that hasn't happened much since then, although the battery runs down really quickly, so it, since then I've had issues uh, where the battery just it turned off because the battery was too low. Um, but I haven't had a just random reboot uh, recently. I take it back. It uh, The mail client doesn't actually work with the account that I created through the online accounts. It's only working through the ones that I created through the app. So I don't know why it has that option. It just doesn't seem to work. Um, it was eventually able to send a message, though. It took a really long time for that to work. It looks like it actually is working. It's just not pulling in the subscribed mailboxes for that account. All right. So yeah, eventually it did. It was able to connect to the one I set up on the online accounts. It just goes to show how confusing this is, and I'm... I mean, just look at how confusing this is. This is a horrible interface. And it just keeps popping up new messages at the top. Oh, this is frustrating. Okay. Uh, the mail client sends email as HTML by default. There's no way of changing that. There's no way that I can tell to PGP sign the emails. There's no way of setting up PGP, which for a phone, a Linux-based, technical user-based phone that is advocating privacy and security is just also just very weird. Presumably, it's just a feature they haven't gotten into. It does not support POP, which probably not a big deal, but it only supports IMAP and SMTP if, in terms of standard protocols. I understand that a lot of the projects that they're working on are probably using engineers that wouldn't be able to help with the, the app. They're web engineers that don't know the innards of the device. They may not be C programmers, etc. One of my concerns about this phone, and one of the things that seems contrary to the messaging that Purism's had about not creating a walled garden, not creating, you know, building on other systems that are out there, is that they've they've been investing in this Librem 1 cloud system. And it just seems like scope creep for something that most, I, I would expect most people buying the Librem 5 for privacy, security, et cetera, wouldn't be interested in. I mean, why put all your eggs in one basket, right? If you're buying the phone because you're paranoid about somebody having the data on it, why then go and connect with the cloud services from the same provider? And I haven't really seen much in terms of how it's being, how their cloud systems are being built, why I should trust them. Maybe I've missed those blog posts, honestly. Feel free to share them if they have them. Apple, on the other hand, has documents about what's encrypted, what's not encrypted, how they ensure privacy of the data at rest and live. With Purism, I can't even figure out how to change the APN. So I don't know how to get an MMS message. I don't know how to get mobile data. There's a dialogue for it. It doesn't work. And when you actually go through it, the reference mockups that are linked to the GNOME project, which is what it's built on, what's actually on device is much, is missing a lot of the, the, the elements. It's, it's clearly incomplete. And that's what a lot of the phone feels like, which is another reason why I don't, really understand why they've stuck with GNOME and GTK rather than going with Plasma or one of the other interfaces that is more complete. Purism did write an, an FAQ on that. Their reason was because they wanted to unify the experience with their desktop, uh, their, their laptops and their uh, mini PCs, which are all based on GNOME. The end result of that is, at the moment, is just a really shoddy experience on the device.
things are clearly not done yet. It's buggy. It means that they're presumably putting effort into things that would exist already had they used an existing project, even if it were a short-term fix. Yeah, and Nokia kept changing things up, and that led to a lot of extra resources, but it meant that end users had usable, functional devices. There's no way to reset this. There's no user reset uh, without just flashing it. There's directions, not user-friendly. Fortunately, you have a 30-day return policy for this, but it's charged a 10% restocking fee, and you've got to pay your own shipping. So for a $500 phone, it's about $50 restocking fee, $30 to mail it. It's 15, a little bit more than 15% fee just to return the phone that is not meeting what is promised. Now, originally, what I had planned to do with this was take it against one of my other phones that I just got, Pixel 4a 5G, and maybe even an iPhone 12, and take a look at how the cameras compared. Here as I'm promised, among other features that would support, that would be supported when this launched, was the camera, 13 megapixel camera. But there's no camera support. There's no camera support. You can make a call and receive a call over the plain telephone network, over the mobiles. There's no There's no VoIP support. There's no VoIP support. Can't get Jabber to work. Mail client is clunky and a horrible experience, but apparently is functional. No calendaring. There's directions on how to use contacts, but you can't sync them. If I want to send a message, look at how small that, that, that window is that I could type in. Not only that, I can't just tap there. Look at this. There's a full screen button. But all it does is hide the button. It's already full screen. Why is that there? And there's a lot of promise to this app. Oh, here you go. You can change the plain text. Once it's already done, you can't set the default. But you can change it while you're writing the message. Some promise here. I, as far as I can tell, you. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. Does it just not support mail subscriptions? It's just such a weird that it's it's finding sent mail and outbox. It's not finding any of my incoming mail for that mail account. There's no SSH client. It doesn't have less installed. I should be able to install those. Let's try apt. Yeah. Install less. By default, there's no control key or modifier keys on the keyboard. But if you switch to terminal, you can get them. Get a little line. Installing less. Failed to fetch. Certificate verification failed. Certificate is not trusted. The certificate chain uses expired certificates. Ah. Suddenly everything makes sense now that I think about it. The reason why none, why it's not connecting my Jabber server, I'm betting, because it thinks it's 2055. For those of you that are watching this in the future, it is still 2020. We are still in the middle of a global pandemic. 
Congratulations to those of you that have made it out alive. All right, so at least let's get us in the right year. And that disables automatic date and time because why would I ever need to set the time? All right, now it has the right time. Obviously, it was relying on NTP previously, which has a sanity check where it won't change the time if it's too far off. So it was never fixing the date. Again, one of those rough edges that it should not be exposed to the user. Let's go back to that Jabber server. Interesting note, uh, password box here. I'm not sure if there is a password here, but let's just type something random. Oh, there you go, there's some passwords. Not my real password. Save it. Start out, cool, you wanna show it? Oh, the eye doesn't do anything. I think I'm tapping on that. Oh, you gotta edit it to hit the eye. Now you can see that I typed a bunch of A's. Oh, cool, all right, I verified it, let's go out. Oh. Let's do that again when we can see it, see? Oh, it's still showing, and I can't hide it. I've gotta go edit, hide. What sort of ridiculous widget is that? Trying to see if this will connect. It just says disconnected still, even after I fixed my password. No indication of what it's doing. Now it's not even trying to connect. It's just saying disconnected. Just doing absolutely nothing. What else is new? There's the generic users dialog, as if this were a normal desktop. There's no way of adding a user through the dialogs. You do it through the command line. Presumably it'll show up here. I, I don't even know. And that seems silly to try. It's an iMac login toggle. Doesn't do anything. So, yeah, I changed my name. No idea what I'm supposed to do now. Hit enter does nothing. Sometimes that's the way to get through things, is hitting enter. Otherwise it just looks like a text box that you could change and nothing happens. A lot of times dialog boxes pop up, uh, pop up. When you're in a dialog, the only way through is to keep hitting enter. That means the keyboard covers everything. The dialog doesn't fit on the page. Automatic brightness doesn't seem to work. If you turn off screen lock, but leave blank screen on, it seems like it still locks the screen anyway. I assume it's because the blank screen is on. Definitely still locks the screen. Screen lock is off. Screen will still lock. Formats are selected as the United States. Still shows temperature and centigrade. Input sources. There's No way, I believe, of supporting. Oh, interesting. So this has a Japanese Kana keyboard. Japanese Kana. And it doesn't have the Unicode glyphs. Awesome. so unfinished that this is unbelievable. And yet they put time into things like support for Pocket and Foursquare. Does anybody outside of Mozilla use Pocket? There's a Kerberos support, supposedly. Can't figure out how to get it to actually recognize my KDC. Uh, uses MIT libcurb. 
Tried writing a curb 5 comp file, didn't seem to get recognized. Not entirely sure what it's trying to do. No idea what these accounts are actually doing if they're added. If you add a Google account or add a Facebook account, does it just presumably it'll add chat client and add mail support? Does it merge the contacts? I don't know. I don't have any of those things. Well, I guess other than for this. I mean, all in all, this phone is just, it, it's a huge disappointment. I can't believe that the price has gone up to $800 for what it is. So back in January when they started shipping, somebody posted to support forum some questions asking, so if I want to use this as my daily driver, how do I do these things? And considering that's what this phone is supposed to be, it's supposed to be a production ready daily driver that can replace an iOS device, it can replace an Android device. It can replace a Nokia device. I think it's reasonable to go look at what the questions are. How do you scan a QR code? You don't, there's no camera. How do you use it like a compass? I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't figure out how to access the sensors other than if they're supported by the drivers, potentially just catting or reading the raw device information. There's no apps that give you any sort of mapping or directional information. How do you use the firewall? That's a good question. See if we have IP tables on here. Default passwords one two three four five six. By the way, there's no onboarding to the device. It's just flashed with a default password. All right, I've got to get back to English keyboard. IP tables. Let's get the terminal one so I can get my control key back. You would think maybe the terminal would have the terminal keyboard by default, but. Yeah, IP tables is there. Sudo apt-get install less. All right. So the users look pretty normal for Linux machine. A GNOME initial setup user, doesn't seem to do anything. I don't see dedicated users for the installed apps. Let's see who owns the mail app. So Geary is owned by root. No set UID, no set GUID. So as expected, like a normal Linux machine, it seems like you're gonna just run everything as your own user. Uh, let me check that. Switch to landscape so we actually see what's on top here. Well, from what you can see, uh, Chatty, any other app that's running are all running as the logged in user. So, in a lot of ways, the the security models that Apple and Google have built in to isolate user data from one app from another app, so your personal contacts. Just jumping in from the future is. I've been trying to work on uh, cutting this together and uh, continuing to use the, the Librem 5 for uh, off and on for the past few weeks. It's been a few weeks since I recorded the first part, uh, still stuck in COVID world. I um, want to clarify a few things that I kind of went and looked up, uh, dug a little bit deeper into the technical details uh, just to confirm some of the things that I was saying. So there's two things that Librem is actually using for the, the Purism, Pure OS and the Librem 5 is actually using for their security model. They're hoping to ship most of their packages with Flatpak, which has manifests that define what 
the Flatpak runtime is supposed to allow. This is very much like Android's permission-based system where it pops up a number of permissions at install time and tells you what the app's gonna do and what you're gonna give it per, uh, preference for. Personally, I find the iOS version much more user-friendly where you can toggle individual, op, uh, individual permissions. The nice thing is that uh, PureOS, even on Librem 5, uh, based on Debian Buster, all have App Armor by default. Uh, the Librem 5 only has a couple of profiles that are defined on the stock version, uh, including one for, it appears, NVIDIA drivers, even though I don't see anything that says it's actually being used. Um, and so those profiles do give the options of defining fine-grained controls. I don't see a UI for it, so if you want to modify them, you're going to be stuck writing your own config files. I assume that the intent is, I believe, that applications that aren't del delivered through Flatpak can have AppArmor profiles provided, um, especially if uh, the default Debian packages are going to be providing some of them. If that's the intent, uh, PureOS will be able to leverage those. I also did verify digging around that the disk is non-encrypted. Um, I was able to modify the disk without logging in in any way. Uh, both uh, verified that the root partition is non-encrypted as well as the user's home directory. Can I use mobile internet for my SIM card? And can I enable or disable it on a top tray or what is it? Uh, so from the, from the status bar menu effectively. Uh, I believe so theoretically it should be able to be enabled disabled from that status bar but since i can't get it to work um, i can't save apns i can modify an apn but i can't it just never saves them so uh, purism says that should work i can't get it to work can i use librem 5 for vr cardboard or youtube 360 videos That cardboard was was specifically Android, but I could be could be wrong about that. Can I use it as a secret camera? Record a video with the display turned off. Again, camera doesn't work. Will I be able to use it with USB on the go cables? Uh, it supports USB C, and supports as a connecting to other devices, keyboards, mouse, supposedly. And will I be able to share with Wi-Fi, like on Android? It does support hotspot. The menu's there. I haven't tried it since I haven't had a network to share. The only thing I've been able to get functional is Wi-Fi. I haven't been able to use a USB-C to Ethernet connection. I haven't been able to get the mobile data working. A lot of my concerns about Purism as a company and Librem 5 as a product come from just being unclear what their roadmap is, what their plan is. A lot of the energy that's gone into Librem 5 looks like, in my opinion, it's been misplaced. The user experience is rubbish. I don't even know what user it's really targeting. It's missing pre-installed things like SSH and less and things that a power user would expect to find there initially, but yeah, can just go and install it. There's things that a normal user that's not looking to hack on an SSH box expect to be there. Like POP3, presumably. Presume some people still use that. There's things that are just confusing, like Kerberos logon. I guess people could just ignore that. The dialogues are just ugly, and they're awkward and there's really bad feedback whether something worked or didn't work sometimes there's no feedback when something works sometimes there's no feedback when something didn't work it's inconsistent it's missing glyphs for sake of argument let's just go check to see if it's got chinese if i pick chinese i just get a qwerty keyboard so i don't understand what the plan is for purism the software, I don't, I don't understand what the market's for. I don't understand why this phone's released the way it was. I don't understand why they've been putting effort into things like, I don't know how much effort went into their awesome 
uh, MVNO. But I've got to imagine the effort they've put into Librem 1 has been non-trivial. I don't know how big the sign-up for that is. I, it just seems like the wrong product for the market that they're, they've got. And, you know, anybody would show this Librem 5 to, there's, there's not a single person that would go out and buy one. It's just a horrible interface. It's a horrible experience. There's the Pine 64 phone, which is incredibly similar spec. It's got some binary blobs, but they've isolated the chips that they're concerning into serial connections, supposedly. But in terms of features, it gives you the Linux machine. It gives you kill switches. And currently you can buy the, the preview editions for $150. Or you can buy it with slightly greater spec for $200. Even the 200 version dollar, their, their higher spec version, is less than 30% the price that they want for the Librem 5 at this point. If you want a Made in America Librem 5, you're paying even more. So the fact that the Pine 64, although it was originally a Fremont, California-based company, is now a Hong Kong-based company and uh, made overseas. I don't know how big of a concern, how, how you, who's going to have those, con how big of a concern that's going to be. If you're going to buy the Beta in America version, sure, that's even more money. I don't know anyone who should buy the Librem 5 at the direction the company is going. PureOS... I'm convinced more than ever is the wrong operating system. It's it doesn't add anything as far it doesn't add anything over stock Debian. The quality of software and hardware from Purism is questionable. And they just haven't put in the effort to make a positive user experience. I'm not going to return mine. It's just the cost of returning it and the restocking fee, even though I didn't get what I wanted. I didn't get what I was promised. It just, it's, it's too high for me to go through the effort. So I'll hold on to it for a little while, see if it gets any better. Worst case, I've got a Linux box. Maybe I'll hack on it in the future. If you haven't put your money down yet, I urge you not to. Keep an eye out. Maybe they'll issue some updates, maybe it'll get better. So we don't even support pop. It's not surprising. No active sync. So what happens when we do outlook.com? I'm not sure what just happened. Oh, we rebooted. 